in order to talk about both this case uh, in which he played a central role in helping bring the reporting to light that showed what the Biden administration is doing, as well as an amazing New York Times article this weekend that really tried to defend the theory that I had just got done explaining that found its way to the court that is embedded in every sector of elite liberal culture. We have with us the independent journalist, the editor of Racket News on Substack, Matt Taibbi. He led the reporting on the Twitter files, has done absolutely vital work in exposing the relationship between the government and big tech uh, and the censorship regime that is at issue in this case and in so many other places. And we are delighted to talk to him. Matt, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Great to see you as always. Great to see you, Glenn. Uh, kind of kind of a brutal day, though, I have to say. <laughs> that, yeah, that, that was, was not a very encouraging oral argument, I have to say. Um, I ha you know, I think, and it's interesting, if we, let, let's start with that, because I think a lot of people were expecting the conservative justices automatically to look at what the Biden administration is doing here and say, oh, this is an obvious and glaring violation of the First Amendment, which is how I look at it. And I think what people don't fully understand about the Supreme Court and these justices is that they are fully embedded in the Washington power structure. They, you know, interact socioeconomically and in every other way and culturally with the people who form the highest levels of government. And there seemed to be this naive sense on the part of even some of the conservative justices that, look, all that was happening here was that the FBI was calling and just trying to be helpful. And the White House is just trying to share their opinions, and there was nothing coercive or abusive or aggressive about it. The decision always rested with big tech. I'm wondering what you make of that dynamic and of the, the way in which the Supreme Court is kind of embedded in the political structure in Washington that they now have to judge. Yeah, Glenn, I, I totally agree. I mean, I, I was really shocked by the difference in the way that these judges talked about the case versus the appellate judges in the, at the, uh, in the lower hearing. Uh, I attended that colloquy in, uh, in New Orleans, and you could tell that the, the judges in that case, if you read that ruling, by the way, they, they cut out quite a lot from the original uh, lower court ruling, and they were you know, pretty even-handed, pretty tough on the plaintiffs in the case. But they were clearly horrified by the evidence. I mean, that was uh, abundantly clear uh, in the way that they interrogated the government's lawyers uh, in that hearing. They repeatedly re, uh, com compared the conduct of these agencies to the mafia. You know, nice Internet platform there. It'd be a shame if something ha would happen to it. Uh, the scale of it they took note of. And that was completely different from how these Supreme Court justices behaved they accepted the central premise that these were just sort of polite, friendly suggestions from the government that's just trying to help save the nation and prevent misinformation, which is incidentally a fundamental misunderstanding of the case. As you know, you know the plaintiffs uh, are actually partly uh, suing because they, they were censored for correcting government misinformation. So um, there was a striking difference between those two institutions, I would say. So I think that the way in which people understand the relationship between government on the one hand and big tech companies on the other is fundamental to how people understand what happened here in terms of what these communications really were about. And the probably the most encouraging exchange happened very early on. I think it might have even been the first question when Justice Alito asked the Deputy Solicitor General Fletcher, he said, you know what, I've been reading these communications between the government and big tech, and what strikes me is the way the government talks to big tech. You know, I was, you know, talking earlier, and I know you've had this experience too, but like when the government tries to convince you not to publish something, but they know it's ultimately your decision, they're very polite. You know, they're trying their best to convince you, to persuade you, to give you information, to negotiate with you, like, hey, maybe if you're going to publish this, you could withhold this. That was the experience I had throughout the entire Snowden reporting and other area instances when I've had classified documents and we've negotiated with the government, or not even negotiated, but just gave the government an opportunity to, look, persuade us. And usually they don't persuade us, but the way they behave themselves is very, very 
deferential because the power is in our hands because they know the ultimate decision rests with us. What Alito was saying in this case was that is not at all. There was no deference that the government was expressing toward these big companies. They were like speaking to like a, a minion or an underling. Like, how dare you not get back to us within 24 hours? Why haven't you taken down this post yet? There was an expectation of obedience and subservience that Alito was saying he had never seen before in the relationship between any equals. This was kind of a, you know, boss employee type of dynamic. You have spent a lot of time in your life now reading through the communications that at least went back and forth between the highest levels of Twitter and the government. How would you characterize what that dynamic was? Yeah, first of all, you're exactly right. Uh, you know, the, the, the government, when it wants to protest um, something to a journalist, first of all, they're talking to the journalist, right, Glenn? I mean, when you've had these interactions before, they're arguing with you. They're not going over your head to talk to your boss and say, and, and, and say you know, you have to hold the story, you have to kill the story for national security reasons. That call would be totally inappropriate and it would be a, a serious question as to whether or not you know the publisher or the editor-in-chief of a major news organization would even take that call it would be maybe a one-time thing that they would that would be appropriate to do no, but, 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 even, uh, but, but, but even in that case matt even if they did try and go over my head or the head of a journalist to the editor-in-chief they're still ultimately trying to persuade the institution right to, we want you not to say this. We want you to, 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 to restrict what you're saying. In this case, they're not going to American citizens saying we would appreciate it if you would take your post down. They're going to third parties, Facebook and Google, and they're saying we want you to censor these American citizens. They're not talking to the American citizens at all. They're trying to get the American citizens silenced by going and having third party corporate platforms censor those citizens for the government. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and the, the tone is completely different from what you would expect in a normal journalistic situation where, uh, as you say, they would be trying to persuade you uh, because they don't have the leverage of being able to order you to do it. Uh, so they would make a best case. They would, you know, pull out the charm, uh, would do whatever they have to do. What we found in the Twitter files and also what uh, significantly what they found in the in the if you buy Murphy v. Missouri case was a tone of really sort of a, a, a master canine kind of relationship where they would say things like, you know, they would ream them out, they would, they would MF them, or they would use profanity. Why isn't this out down yet? Why hasn't this been fixed? Uh, they would blithely just give them huge lists of names and you write back six hours later, how come no, there's been no action? You know, we found in the Twitter files uh, emails that said things like, um, you know, sorry to add to your workload, right? Uh, sort of jokingly when they would send them spreadsheets with thousands of names as if it was their obligation as, as a kind of subcontractor to do this work. Whereas if there was really any kind of independence, uh, they would clearly not be taking that tone. And the reason they can do that, Glenn, as you know, is because they're holding this sort of Damocles over their head with these gigantic subsidies like Section 230. Uh, uh, you know, if they suggest a change to that, it would change the entire revenue structure for these companies, and they know that, and then it's often spelled out. And they've threatened and it before. They... They've threatened it before. They've said, if you don't censor more, we're going to take away your 230 protection. I've heard them say that. They're, it's in the record. They, the Congress has said that. This is a threat that they don't allow to be implicit. They make it explicit and manifest. I mean, and they did it in press conferences even, right? I mean, if I remember correctly, the, 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 they would say that, you know, the, these, these companies are killing people, uh, you know, th through their in, uh, inattention to uh, the vaccination misinformation. And then two seconds later, they would say, maybe we need to rethink uh, our position on Section 230. I mean, it's not exactly subtle. Uh, this stuff's really right out in the open. And another thing that we found in the Twitter files was that Twitter clearly understood uh, these constructions to be a threat. 
They talked about how their you know, legislation is being considered that would affect our revenue. Uh, this is very open and there's an abundance of evidence, um, not just from us, but, but what was dug up in the depositions and in the document discovery of this lawsuit. Uh, there's no shortage of it. It's very clear what the quid pro quo is meant to be and why they were taking that tone. And so you're very right to point, point that out. Yeah, and I think the other thing that's worth noting is that in this case, it, the, the, the incentives that these big tech platforms have to assuage and please and obey the government is not only an avoidance of punishment, meaning, oh, we better do what they say or they'll take away our 230 protection, but also these governments lavish on these platforms gigantic contracts, you know, like Apple and Facebook and Google do billions of dollars worth of work for the Pentagon and for the CIA and cloud storage, all kinds of services. And if one of these companies steps out of line and allows things to be said that the government made clear they don't want being said, that contract can just go to some other corporation. I mean, part of your duty, you could argue, if you're the CEO of Facebook and Google, is to make sure you're keeping the government happy because of how important the government is for your business. All right, Matt, let me, I want to get into this New York Times article because uh, you wrote about it. And in a lot of ways, it was a hit piece on you, but it was also really an attempt to, I, I thought it was very valuable in terms of expressing the liberal mind when it comes to, to free speech and how they see free speech as this like annoying obstacle that's now in their way to have the government do all the things they think the government has to do. But I want to ask you about one claim in particular first that relates to the Supreme Court ruling what we were just talking about. So there's the, the, the article you wrote on today's absurd New York Times hit piece. You say correcting the record after a desperate slam job on the Twitter files published just before oral arguments in a historic First Amendment case in the Supreme Court. It's up on your Substack uh, this week. And one of the inaccuracies you point out that, hap that was, was expressed in the New York Times article was that in your very first story that you published on the Twitter files, the first of many dozens by you and multiple other journalists, you being the honest journalist that you are, said, within these documents I'm reporting, I can't say there's direct evidence of US government orders or forcible order instructions to censor, but there's a lot of circumstantial evidence of it. The New York Times took that and quoted that in their story to try and say that the Twitter files never found any evidence of any actual government instruction or direction by your own admission. Why was that so misleading to the point of being deceitful by the New York Times? Yeah, and not only did they claim that, but they claimed that we got that idea from- Mike uh, Benz. Mike Benz, a former Trump administration official who we didn't even meet until we really, the Twitter file stories were over. The, the significance of what they were saying and the reason it was so deceptive, and I, I can't believe that these two experienced reporters, Jim Rutenberg and Stephen Lee Myers, didn't read the actual Twitter files reports, is that, yes, although it was true that when we looked at the documents and uh, uh, w relating to the Hunter Biden laptop story, which is the subject of the first Twitter files report, uh, I didn't find correspondents talking about direct FBI involvement uh, in that case. But in all the subsequent reports after that, within days uh, of going, moving on from that story, we found on a grand scale in enormous quantities uh, evidence of direct government involvement in all kinds of other things related to the 2020 election, uh, COVID, uh, the Russiagate scandal. Uh, it was one email after another where we saw things like flagged by DHS, flagged by uh, FBI, flagged by FITF, flagged by Treasury, flagged by other government, uh, other government organizations. And this led us to find more documents that described a very formalized, uh, elaborate relationship between all of these agencies and and other forms. So that was the subject of months of reporting that occupied most of December of 2022 and January of 2023. The implication that we only hit upon that thesis when we met Mike Benz in March of the next year is deeply uh, sort of deceitful.
And I, I mean, I think as you saw, the wording was about as bad as it gets when, when it comes to that kind of thing. So if you'll indulge me, I do want to go over a couple of these passages from this New York Times article in part because you wrote about it, but also because I think sometimes when the New York Times publishes something, it's just so valuable as kind of a window into how liberal elites are really thinking. And I was involved in this discussion in the last few days with a bunch of Brazilians about this perception in the United States, alleged by some people, that I've somehow changed my ideological alignment from the left to the right, that you've done the same. There's some idiotic book coming out that makes this claim. And it is interesting that free speech and a defense of it in opposition to censorship has been something that you at, the, at Rolling Stone magazine, of all places, of course, and myself have had as a central cause. And nobody ever until like six years ago suggested that a defense of free speech was a coded right wing value. And I was trying to explain to these Brazilians that in the United States, if you now defend free speech, it almost automatically implies that you are a right wing figure. And I was, I, I, they had trouble understanding that for reasons that I get because, you know, the influence is on me from my free speech views when I was, you know, a kid and growing up were like the leftist lawyers at the ACLU and Noam Chomsky, who defended a French professor who was a Holocaust revisionist saying he shouldn't lose his tenure, even though he's a Holocaust revisionist because the state has no right to dictate what is true and false, even when it comes to Holocaust revisionism. This was a view that was, yeah, the, the whole free speech movement started at Berkeley. Like a lot of the most important free speech precedents of the 20th century were written by left wing judges. But here's the New York Times. And as you say in your Substack article, replying to it and criticizing it, it's clearly designed to prepare liberals for this oral argument that happened today. And here's the headline of it. How Trump's allies are winning the war over disinformation. Their claims of censorship. Notice, the only people worried about censorship are Trump allies. Their claims of censorship have successfully stymied the effort to filter election lies online. So here's the New York Times framework of how to understand free speech, Matt. On the one hand, you have far right Trump supporting extremists like you and me who are worried about free speech. And then on the other hand, you have good responsible people who want the government to fight lies online. And the only thing standing in the way of the government's ability to fight on lies online and to remove those lies by doing things like having Homeland Security create a department of, of misinformation or have the Biden administration be able to coerce big tech are right wing extremists like you and me who, because we want Trump to win, are raising these issues of free speech. Do you see how liberals now think about free speech? It makes so much sense when you think about it this way, why they now hear free speech and think that it's right wing. Well, it's in, I see it, and it's <laughs> unbelievably frustrating, um, as I'm sure it is for you. Um, one of my first jobs in journalism, I was an intern at the Village Voice. I sat next to Nat Hentoff, who was... Uh, sort of a legendary uh, advocate for free speech on the left. And this was during a time period where, just to take an example that's directly analogous to this current situation, if you remember, the FBI once sent a letter to, I think it was Death Row Records, mm -hmm. after the NWA uh, put out straight out of Compton, certainly recommending that this was not a good record, that you know, advocating violence against the police was a bad thing. Um, that was an enormous scandal in liberal America. It was, it was a, covered in every major newspaper in the country. It was condemned when the FBI sent one letter to one record label about one song. You know, what we found was that times 1,000, 10,000, you know, 100,000, and the response, as you point out, is all these people are delusional. This isn't really bad. They're just trying to help. They're trying to prevent election lies. And again, I stress enough that this case, this particular case, you know, the, the, the plaintiffs were not committing disinformation. The, these were medical professionals who were the most credential kinds of ac academics who had conducted true research and were suppressed because 
rest of it because the government was in error. And this gets to something that, Glenn, I think you and I have always agreed about in our careers, which is that the most dangerous misinformation is always official. The official lies, whether it's Gulf of Tonkin or the WMDs or Russiagate or whatever it is, those are the most dangerous. And the only defense against that is unfettered free speech in which people get to express their opinions and do independent reporting. But they want that suppressed. This new vision of kind of American liberalism sees that as the enemy. They have successfully painted that as a, and coded it as a right-wing view. It's a complete 180 that we have to reckon with now. I, I, I'm curious to know what your thoughts are about how, how we go about fixing it. Matt, if it, there's no question in my mind that if this framework that has been created, and I really believe it was created after 2016 as a reaction to Brexit and then to Hillary Clinton's defeat, Donald Trump's election, where they said, holy shit, we can't all allow free speech on the Internet. Look at these people going wild. And, and ignoring what we're telling them to do. If, if, if the UK can leave the EU and Donald Trump can beat Hillary Clinton, what can't happen? We've lost all control if we allow free speech. And this is where this disinformation industry was concocted out of nowhere. They got Pierre Omidyar and George Soros and Bill Gates to fund it. And it's not a conspiracy theory. Those are the people who are behind it, along with intelligence agencies Reed that Hoffman. fund these. <laughs> Reed Hoffman, all these liberal activists. And the idea was let put a scientific gloss on the censorship regime so that we can pretend that we're not censoring political speech or dissent that we dislike. We're censoring some scientific category that we've now invented a new credential in called disinformation. And it's disinformation experts, apolitical disinformation experts, who now identify the kind of information that is both false and dangerous and that can justify its removal. Let me just, I got to read to you the New York Times kind of attempt to explain to their readers what happened with these cases. Because, I, like, I think that, you know, you had two cases, two, two uh, courts, a district court and then an appellate court in 2023 who ruled that the Biden administration committed one of the gravest assaults on the free speech guarantee of the First Amendment in decades. And I guarantee you most Americans have no idea that happened. Because the same people that told Americans to ignore your reporting because it was a big nothing burger are the ones who looked at this and said, oh, this is, this is nothing. This is good. So here's the New York Times now realizing, well, we got to kind of tell our readers what the Supreme Court's about to decide. Here's their version of, of how to understand this. Quote, in September, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit scaled the order back significantly, meaning the district court ruling, but still found the government had most likely overstepped the limits of the First Amendment. That sent the case to the Supreme Court, where justices recently expressed deep reservations about government intrusion in social media. Ahead of the court's decision, agencies across the government have virtually stopped communicating with social media companies, fearing the legal and political fallout as the presidential election approaches, according to several government officials who described the retreat on the condition of anonymity. Three years after Mr. Trump's post about rigged voting machines and stuffed ballot boxes went viral, he and his allies have achieved a stunning reversal of online fortune. Social media platforms now provide fewer checks against the intentional spread of lies about elections. Quote, the people that benefit from the spread of disinformation have effectively silenced many of the people that would try to call them out, said Kate Starbird, a professor at the University of Washington, whose research on disinformation made her a target of the effort. It took a, a aim at a patchwork of systems started in Mr. Trump's administrations that were intended to protect U.S. democracy from foreign interference. As those, system, as those systems evolved to address domestic sources of misinformation, federal officials and private researchers began urging social media companies to do more to enforce their policies against harmful content. This is the New York Times telling their readers that the only thing the government is doing is trying to keep everybody safe from Donald Trump's lies and from disinformation that's designed to help Donald Trump. And this is why they think that if you stand up and say, you know what, on free speech grounds, I don't want the government controlling online speech. I don't want the government dictating what is and is not disinformation. This is why they think you're on the right, because they believe that the only people who would believe in free speech at this point are people on the right, because the censorship is designed to protect the country 
from right-wing extremism. I mean, do you, is, do you see how clear it is when they, when they frame it this way? Oh, absolutely. And, and notice how many things they gloss over in, in just that little passage, uh, like the fact that they presented this entire program as a, an effort against foreign misinformation and disinformation and sort of on the fly converted it to uh, allowing the State Department, for whatever reason, to be involved in uh, combating domestic uh, misinformation and disinformation. But leaving all that aside, you're absolutely right. They frame this as being about Trump, being about things like Sharpie Gate, whereas, in fact, it's a whole galaxy of topics that most of them, most of which have nothing to do with Donald Trump. Uh, a lot of them are just a, a sort of a broad switch uh, from basically from what one source of mine called CT to CP, counterterrorism to counterpopulism. It's just government uh, going after stories that are that run counter to official narratives, and they just don't like that idea. A great example being, again, in this case, uh, you had Dr. Jay Bhattacharya. Now. The WHO, but like a PhD, a scientist, a highly respected expert in public health at Stanford University, whose views were continuously censored, even though most of them turned out to be true. He's one of the plaintiffs in the case, alleging that the government was responsible for the censorship of his political opinions online. That, that's one of the people they, whose speech they got censored, was one of the leading, most credentialed experts in the scientific establishment. Go ahead. Sorry, I just had to emphasize who yeah, no. he is. No, of course. And, and, and I know Jay, and Jay is more interested in board games than politics. He's, he's the farthest thing from a Trumpist that you could possibly imagine. But if you remember early in the pandemic, Glenn, the WHO put out this terrifying uh, press release in early March saying that they were estimating the inf infection mortality rate to be 3.4%. Uh, which is an enormous number. I mean, that, we were looking at a specter of millions of deaths, possibly even that in that year. Well, Dr. Bhattacharya had conducted a, an experiment in Sar Santa Clara County that found that they had overstated that number by roughly a factor of 22, uh, that the real infection mortality rate was closer to 0 0.015, which was exactly matched the numbers that came came out of French cruise ship on the Diamond Princess. Uh, he also found that the disease was far more infectious than the government was letting on, which meant that interventions like masking and lockdowns were not likely to be infect, uh, effective, not because of any ideological reason, but just because they wouldn't work. The, the, the disease is going to be, people were going to get it anyway. Uh, so they suppress this. They suppress true information uh, because they they were advancing this other idea that this was the most terrifying thing in history and they stood behind it for a year and a half and suppressed doctors who had a, an opposing view that they later conceded was correct now that's that's why we have the first amendment we have the first amendment to prevent the government from uh, creating a hegemonic uh, opinion that no one can challenge and they it, it was a missed you and, and overlooked exactly as our, the constitutional framers feared in this case. And that is what is so terrifying about the situation. And Matt, the thing that is so important in what you just said that I just have to draw out and emphasize is it is not confined to one issue. It's not like this was done as an emergency against election uh, questioning of 2020 because of the insurrection, quote unquote. It wasn't done as an emergency in response to the COVID pandemic. It was a framework, it is a framework that is being used in every major political debate. We've seen the same kinds of censorship on the same basis when it comes to the war in Ukraine. The first in fact, where, where people were constantly being censored because they were challenging the NATO narrative about Ukraine. Rumble is not available in France because France demanded that Rumble remove RT and other Russian state media as a condition to remaining in France. And when Rumble said, we're not going to remove Russian state media because if people want to hear it, they should be able to, now Rumble is unavailable in France. This is a precedent that they have created. And of course, after October 7th, it has been applied to Israel as well. The first case the EU brought under their new censorship law to claim that 
X is violating you E law by allowing too much information is based on an allegation that Elon Musk and Twitter did not censor enough anti-Israel content and therefore became guilty under the law. It is a framework that is going to be applied to every major political debate, which is what the purpose of censorship precedents are. If you don't mind, I have two other quick passages of the New York Times article mm -hmm. that I just have to share with you. Uh, and to no, ask you about. Yeah, no. um, Okay, so I was saying before that like a bridge too far, the one bridge too far was when they tried to put that crazy resistance fanatic, that neurotic woman in charge of the Office of Disinformation under the Department of Homeland Security. Everybody was like, this is a ministry of truth. This is like what Orwell warned about explicitly. It's a ministry of truth inside Homeland Security. The New York Times is revisiting this as an example, not of the government going too far, but of the way in which right-wing fanatics like you and me prevented the government from doing the good things it should have done. Here, listen to what they said, quote, even before the court rules, Mr. Trump's allies have succeeded in paralyzing the Biden administration and the network of researchers who monitor disinformation. Matt, we have paralyzed the Biden administration as well as these newfound experts who monitor disinformation, quote, officials at the Department of Homeland Security this is who the New York Times is upset are being impeded. Officials at the Department of Homeland Security and the State Department continue to monitor foreign disinformation, but the government has suspended virtually all cooperation with the social media platforms to address posts that originate in the United States. Quote, there's just a chilling effect on all of this said Nina Yankovic, a researcher who in 2022 briefly served as the executive director of the short-lived Homeland Security Advisory Board on Disinformation. Quote, nobody wants to be caught up in it. Matt, the New York Times is angry <laughs> what, that Homeland Security me? is no longer allowed to monitor and control domestic speech inside the United States. What is there to even say about that? I, I mean, Glenn, I, I, I'm sure you've had this experience of having discussions with people who used to be down the middle, sort of ACLU liberals, and you would say something like, you, you know that the foreign intelligence services like the CIA um, or even the State Department are by statute like pre prevented from engaging in changes of propaganda, they are not allowed to do uh, state-sponsored sp censorship within the, the United States, and yet they have these whole formalized structures that they want to impose. How can you be in favor of that? And But there is. There's a whole new generation of people who believe that that's totally appropriate. I think they just cast it as a Trump, anti-Trump issue. I mean, the, the lengths they went to describe somebody like me as a Trump ally. Uh, Solely you, because you believe in free speech. Matt, everything, this is the thing I think is so important to understand. Every last issue in our political discourse is viewed through one prism and one prism only. Is it pro-Trump or anti-Trump? That is why, as long as you, if you can be a neocon who 10 years ago, liberals were calling Nazis, for supporting torture chambers and CIA black sites and Guantanamo and due process free uh, imprisonment, people like Liz Cheney or Nicole Wallace. And as long as you criticize Donald Trump but don't change any of your other views, liberals adore you. The only prism that they understand, they're monomaniacally obsessed with Donald Trump. Everything is pro-Trump or anti-Trump. And because, and this is why this New York Times article is so important, they see free speech as a major obstacle to stopping Trump, because censorship is their main tool to stop Trump, the only people they believe would advocate for free speech are people who love Donald Trump. This really is how they think. Yeah, and, and just two quick things about that. Please. First, um, uh, you know, obviously the, the co-author of this piece, Jim Rutenberg, uh, um, wrote a very, very influential piece in the New York Times in 2016 called Trump is testing the norms of objectivity in journalism, which basically said we had to change the way we do business, that we no longer had to worry about just printing facts, but printing facts that, quote, stand up to history's judgment. It, it, if you remember it, Glenn, it was kind of a clarion call telling us that we 
had to accept a more oppositional role and understand that the, the content that we printed was important because Donald Trump was such a big threat that we, we had to choose what we covered and what we wrote accordingly, right? And so he, he makes it very plain in this piece that he, he talks about how uh, a central part of Trump's social media. And so therefore, uh, gaining some control over social media, it's almost like they, they assume that the readers will come to the correct conclusion and believe, well, if uh, a central element of Trump's success is social media, it follows, right, like three dots, and therefore, um, we must have more control over social media. They think like that. I mean, this, this is actually how they think. There, there is no longer any First Amendment free, free speech principle involved. I mean, I, I'm not a Trump supporter, but you cannot throw out the First Amendment because you don't like, like Donald Trump. And this is uh, this is how they think. It's it's just unbelievable the way the business has turned on a dime on, over this issue. Right. I mean, just the fact that they can say with a straight face, one of the reasons it's so important that we stop Donald Trump and imprison him before the election is because if he gets into power, he may politicize the Justice Department and try and turn it against his political opponents. And there's nothing in their brain that alerts them to the contradiction in that in that formulation shows you how far gone they are in terms of only seeing everything as either pro-Trump or anti-Trump. And as long as it's pro-Trump, whatever it is, it's justified. Now, I love this New York Times article so much, and I hate it so much too. And I could spend all night just going over every paragraph with you because it's just filled with every pathology and sickness of the liberal mind in the United States. But I, ha I, I just can't not do this one last one. Um, and then I'm going to let you go because this one Okay, so as you know, Matt, because we've talked about it so often and you wrote about it and lots of other people did, I left The Intercept in 2020 when they refused to allow me to publish an article analyzing the contents of what was on Hunter Biden's laptop and what it said about Joe Biden and his ethics because a week earlier, they had published an article just like every other media outlet did saying, citing the CIA, that the Hunter Biden laptop and the materials on it were Russian disinformation and therefore could not be trusted. Now, as everybody knows, that was a lie. The materials on the Hunter Biden laptop were completely authentic and genuine down to the last comma. It was obvious back then. That's why I was willing to stake my journalistic reputation on it. But it's everybody admits it now, including the New York Times and the and everybody else. And yet nobody ever went back and said, hey, remember when we spent weeks right before the 2020 election telling you that the Hunter Biden materials were Russian disinformation because the CIA told us that it turned out that was false. OK, I, I try to let that go, the fact that they will never retract that. <laughs> but listen to this, Matt, the Hunter Biden laptop episode is cited in The New York Times as a example of why censorship is so important. Here's what they say, quote. Social media, with its pipeline to tens of millions of voters, presented powerful new pathways for anti-democratic tactics, but with far fewer of the regulatory and legal limits that exist for television, radio, and newspapers. So they're saying... The, what are they the, talking about? They're, they're, they're oh, saying that the yeah. problem with the, inter, with the internet is it's too, at least with radio and television, you had a small number of corporations that could be controlled by the government. And the problem with the internet if there's not enough control, there's too much free speech. And then here's their example. Quote, the pitfalls were clear. During the 2020 campaign, platforms had rushed to bury a New York Post article about Hunter Biden's laptop out of concern that it might be tied to Russian interference. Conservatives saw that as an attempt to tilt the scales to Mr. Biden. Administration officials said they were seeking a delicate balance between the First Amendment and social media's rising power over public opinion. Quote, we're in the business of critical infrastructure, and the most critical infrastructure is our cognitive infrastructure, said Jen Easterly, the director of the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, whose responsibility includes protecting the national voting system. Quote, building that resilience to misinformation and disinformation, I think, is incredibly important. Matt, they are lamenting the fact that the government now has a harder time doing things like burying the Hunter Biden story 
because apparently they think a true story because implicit in that is that that was a Russian disinformation plot and the government needed to protect us by burying it. And they didn't just bury it, by the way, they censored it. Facebook algorithmically suppressed it up until the election. Twitter actually brute censored it based on a lie. And the New York Times, Matt, to this day is still citing that as an example of the kind of reporting we need the government to suppress. This is an explicit pro-censorship manifesto from the New York Times. And, you know, I, I, I understand that political operatives will want to censor. That's why we need a First Amendment to bar them from doing so. Political officials, government officials always want to censor. The thing that has amazed me the most that I find absolutely surreal is that 40 years ago, this newspaper was going to the Supreme Court to protect the right of newspapers and citizens to express themselves without government censorship. And now they're running not op-eds, but news articles that have no purpose other than to discredit free speech advocates as far-right extremists and to herald government censorship as the only thing that can save us. is I mean, of all the things that we live through that are absolutely bizarre, to me at least, that is the most bizarre and disturbing. How do you feel about that? Yeah, no, Glenn, I'm with you on that. I mean, first of all, that topic came up in when I testified before the House uh, the, there was a question, I, I believe it was from one of the representatives from Massachusetts who, uh, who, who said, well, aren't you concerned that this would be like 2016 uh, hack and leak operation? You know, the Hunter, you're basically talking about the Hunter Biden story um, you, that, you know, that so affected that election. And I had to interject and say that story was true. Whatever, whatever you care about the, the source of the you know the WikiLeaks disclosures, um, there was nothing inaccurate about it, and but their minds are now wired to think that even something that is true can be misinformation or disinformation or malinformation. So in this case now, even though the disinformation was actually on the part of the CIA, they were the ones who put out the false story that this story came from the Russians, and that was accepted. Uh, by all the journalists and, uh, who, who covered that story. They're worried about the true part, which was the, the story that Miranda Devine at, at the New York Post put out. As a, Twitter didn't just uh, suppress the story. They blocked people from sending it to each other via direct message, which is a tool they only used uh, against child pornography, uh, usually. But the, the, the remarkable th thing about this is this that it shows the, the incredible lengths to which they will go to suppress uh, something that's accurate in the name of national security. And they no longer understand, I think, the difference, like why we allow uh, true information to get out there. Because they, they don't trust the public to make the right decisions when they see something that's true. Uh, so the, obviously kid, the, the public, their children, they have to be pre prevented from seeing the bad thing, and it's natural to them that they must have that role, which I think is crazy. Uh, and it's amazing to see journalists going along with it. Yeah, exactly. And I think, like, you know, I think it's important to note, because we're talking about liberal orthodoxy, I think some people are surprised to hear justices they regard as conservative, like Brett Kavanaugh, Amy Coney Barrett, even to some extent John Roberts, seemingly sympathetic. Not necessarily as much as, say, Katanji uh, Brown-Jackson, but s still somewhat sympathetic. And I think it's very important to note that this isn't so much of an anti-Trump sentiment. The fear is that people will become too populist, meaning they'll become too independent of institutions of authority. And they need to be constrained. They need to be controlled. They can't be given too much freedom. And there are a lot of people embedded in the conservative establishment who look at the Trump movement and the populism that it's, that it's provoking and any kind of anti-establishment ideology, including on the left, and that's their real enemy. And so it shouldn't surprise people that kind of traditional conservatives like Mitch McConnell and Mitt Romney, and it's not surprising that some of the justices on the Supreme Court who are regarded as conservative are a lot more like Mitt Romney and Mitch McConnell than they are, say, like Donald Trump, also view 
this kind of wild west on the internet as being too dangerous to permit and therefore are sympathetic to government attempts to try and put some limitations on it. And in that, they share the same views as the New York Times, which happens all the time these days, that the two establishment wings of both political parties find themselves much more in agreement than not. And I think the reason that what that means is that left right is not really the relevant metric any longer it's more are you within that establishment do you want to strengthen it do you believe in its right to control or do you see it as something to be subverted and something to be liberated from and we just kind of have the wrong vocabulary that if you're on the outside of that establishment and see it as a threat and something to be liberated from you now get described as being right wing and it's just the wrong vernacular but at the end of the day, I don't really care about the labels. I care about these values. Yeah, and, and Glenn, just quickly, I know we're running out of time, but you went through this with the Snowden reporting, the hostility that you got from the national security apparatus was really aimed at the idea that the, the public can't be entitled, they're not entitled to get even information that might upset them because there needs to be this establishment control uh, over information. There are some things that the public just can't handle, right? This was this, this attitude that was very pervasive. And you saw it even in some uh, you know, prominent journalists who gave you a hard time and suggested that you were an accomplice to crime and that, that sort of thing. Well, here, you know, one of the things we found in the Twitter files, you know, there was research uh, backing this Aspen Institute tabletop exercise where uh, some of the nation's most prominent national security journals gathered to do a tabletop uh, planning uh, routine for the potential release of a uh, story about Hunter Biden and Burisma, where one of the central tenets of, uh, of the meeting was rejecting what they called the Pentagon Papers principle, which was they, that this idea that we now think more about where information comes from versus whether or not it's it's true right so it, it, essentially they've convinced the press to consider itself part of the establishment now like we, we are at the new york times and the washington post we're part of these guardians this vanguard that decides what the public can and cannot handle uh, we don't want to be a conduit for things that might rile up the population. And, you know, 40, 50 years ago, when Cy Hirsch uh, was considered the great journalist of our uh, time, uh, they've had that attitude. But now this is the prevailing attitude among establishment journalists. And as you know, Glenn, it's, it's just such a, an, an incredible revolutionary change in how we look at things. Uh, that it's stunning to watch, but never more forcefully expressed than in this piece, as you put it. Yeah, and I, I'm sorry, just I just need that one thing, because I could go on all night about this, that, that honestly what really happened inside these journalistic institutions, as you all know too, is that in the age of Trump, they jettisoned every longstanding principle. I mean, they cheered a blogger who turned over her own source voluntarily to the FBI when for decades it was a sterling principle of journalism that even if the FBI subpoenas you and forces you to turn over your source, you go to jail before doing it. But one of the things yeah, that career, it was career ending to 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 to, to think, give up a source. Yeah, but, but to let alone to do it voluntarily to beg the and they cheered her for doing it because they saw it as a strike against Trump. But the big thing that they changed is exactly what you just said, which is journalists never previously cared about a source's motives or who the source was. As long as the information was genuine and in the public interest, that's all you cared about. And one of the things that happened in 2016, as you probably remember, was everybody was desperate to get their hands on Trump's tax returns. And somebody, and to this day, the New York Times has no idea who, took part of Trump's tax returns from an old year, 12, 2012 or 2013, dropped it in the mail and sent it to the New York Times. The New York Times got the story, got the tax returns, and they verified it and they wrote about it, they published it. And I remember the, the, the journalist who was the lead journalist, David Barstow, who won two Pulitzers for other reporting, went on NPR and NPR said to him, how can you publish this information when you have no idea who the source is? And he said, journalists don't care about the source. We don't care, you know, 
the source in Watergate was motivated by like petty and vindictive anger over her being passed over by Richard Nixon for a promotion to the FBI director. Sometimes sources are terrible people. Sometimes they have terrible motives. All you care about is, is the document genuine and is it in the public too. interest? And these institutions after 2016 and WikiLeaks changed their internal policy to say that if there's information that we get, even if it's genuine and even it's in the public interest, we should consider not publishing it if it comes from a source with bad motives, namely a foreign source trying to help Trump win. They explicitly changed the core standards that govern journalism for decades in the name of preventing any kind of reporting that might help Donald Trump win or his opponent lose. That was what they did with the Hunter Biden story, and it's what they've done continuously and will continue to do because they now really don't even pretend anymore that their mission is journalism. They see their mission as stopping Trump and everything else is a means to that end. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update, our live show that airs every Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on Rumble. You can catch the full nightly shows live or view the backlog of episodes for free on our Rumble page. You can also find full episodes the morning after they air across all major podcasting platforms, including Spotify and Apple. All the information you need is linked below. We hope to see you there.